Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I am your host, Sean Needham, and I am streaming live from the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Studio today. And it is two days before Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. And um, I am super excited to have Dr. Neil Rousier on our podcast today. He is a recognized expert in hormone replacement. And when I mentioned to people that he was going to be on, I had some doctors reach out to me and say, you know, please tell him that he changed my life. So he has taught thousands of healthcare providers all over the world on hormone replacement. And he has been doing that for 20 plus years. Now, I can't imagine how many of the thousands, how many hundreds of thousands of lives that those healthcare providers have touched with hormone replacement because of Dr. Rousier. Um, I am one of them. Um, Janet is one of them. We have been trained by Dr. Rousier and went to, um, he has a five part series. Um, of hormone replacement and a certification program. And I've been to three parts and hopefully next June, I'm going to go to part four. And I've been to some of the parts twice because they're so good. So I just can't get enough. He, he, he expresses all the presentations are based on science and he has a lot of patient cases too and stories how he has really changed patients' lives and he's going to share some of those today. So um, I'm super excited to have him on. You don't want to miss out because at the end, we're going to have a question and answer session. Today, we're going to be talking about, and Steph, if you can stream our title today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about testosterone and the cardiovascular the cardiovascular benefits of testosterone for men and for women. So we're going to try to discuss that in the first uh, part of the show. Then we're going to have a question and answer session. But as always, please feel free to comment during the show and ask Dr. Rousier a question. You can always call into uh, 509-537-0411. So without further ado, let's get started uh, on this program. Dr. Rousier, Go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you got into hormone replacement. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, and um, an early Merry Christmas. Um, th that's a uh, that's about a, a ten hour um, story as to how I got into it. Uh, to make a long story short, um, I started prescribing hormones for my nursing staff years ago, and, and the reason I did that was because they asked me to. And I knew nothing about doing it. I knew nothing. It wasn't in any textbook. There wasn't any medical journal articles. Um, and so one of my nurses, Barbara, uh, said, well, you know, I'm taking these hormones. And the doctor that was prescribing them uh, was uh, prescribing them through a compounding pharmacist. And, and I, knew, I didn't even know what a compounding pharmacist was. Um, and she put me in touch with this compounding pharmacist who educated me and told me, well, this is what you prescribe. And this is how you prescribe it. And so I sort essentially did what the pharmacist was telling me to do. I knew nothing about it. And then um, I learned from my nursing staff that when they took a certain hormone, whatever that was, it made them feel better, which I didn't want to believe. And I sort of rejected because, you know, that's not the way I was taught or trained. Right. You know, there's no science to it, yada, yada, yada. Right. But when I did that, they all felt better. And suddenly the nurses were coming back and telling me, as you well know, well, when you prescribe the thyroid pill, um, I felt much better. But when I took two of them, I felt tremendously better. And okay. I said, no, you shouldn't be taking thyroid. Your thyroid tests are normal. Get your doctor to do it, yada, yada, yada. And they said, no, please, our doctor won't do it. Um, but when we do this, when we take this, it makes us feel so much better. You don't understand how much better it makes us feel. And I said, that was a placebo effect. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't make you feel better. Hormones don't make you feel better. Thyroid does not make you feel better. Uh, testosterone does not make you feel better. Es estradiol, whatever that was, uh, bioidentical estrogen, whatever that was, doesn't make you feel better. No, that... And they said, but you don't understand. Yes, it does. And so I finally took a back seat and said, can they all be wrong? Um, uh, and I'm right. No, I, I was wrong because I didn't understand it. And they were right. And so I got into it because I listened to my patients, which led me down this other path of where I am today after 25 years teaching what I do. And I teach what I do based on, as you well know, the medical journal literature and articles that say, when you optimize thyroid, people will feel and function better. When you optimize estrogen, estradiol, they will feel and function better. When you optimize testosterone in both men and women, they will feel and function much better. But as you well know, 
there's a health benefit to doing that. And I was not aware of it. And there's probably nothing better. There's no better drug out there for cardiovascular protection. And, and I use the, the term drug loosely than estradiol in women and testosterone in men as well as in women. So that's how I got into it. A long, yeah. long story made short. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 when we were chatting last night on the phone, Dr. Ruzier, um, you know, both of you and I have a passion for, for this subject. And I literally made, you know, a comment that, you know, we could talk for days. So, and we really could, cause I love it. And I love what you do and thank you for what you do. And thank you for listening to your patients. And I think as healthcare professionals, I think a lot of people that do end up getting into hormone replacement, that's one of the things that, um, kind of started them off on hormone replacement is they started a little bit with one or two patients and then they just felt better. So it's good that we have somebody like yourself to back up, back it all up by science so we can keep helping more and more patients. So thank you so much. So on the topic of testosterone and cardiovascular benefit, um, I always talk about, I, I got into a debate with a doctor a few weeks ago, an orthopedic surgeon, and you, you know, you're talking about no better drug than testosterone for cardiovascular um, support, but I talked to him about bone density and I told him, I, I challenged him. I said, Hey doctor, if you can, as an orthopedic surgeon, if you can find a better drug for osteoporosis than testosterone, I challenge you to do so. I don't think you will. And I just think people forget to read their basic anatomy physiology book about how important testosterone is for so many different things. If we had a drug that could do all the things as testosterone does, it would be 10 different drugs. So on that note, Dr. Rousier, um, tell us how testosterone benefits our cardiovascular system, men and women. Because we're taught there's a black box warning on testosterone and regel testosterone that it causes heart attacks in men, right? You're right. It, that, that's the black box warning, and that's what it says. Um, but uh, just like you just said, um, for anyone that says, no, you shouldn't use it because it causes heart attacks, um, I challenge, just like you challenge the orthopedic surgeon, you know, show me the studies, show me the literature yep. that shows that it's harmful. Um, show me the studies where it increases the risk of heart attacks. Show me a randomized controlled trial, an outcome study. And they can't because there aren't any, and because testosterone does just the opposite. Um, but the problem is, is that when... There's one or two studies, and the studies, as you well know, are the Finkel and the Vegan study, which are very flawed studies, but they got published, and the various medical societies challenged um, Pilos 1 and JAMA to retract those papers that were flawed. They didn't, because it would be egg on their face that, you know, we actually published a study that was not true, that was of a bad quality. And so they, they, they let the study up, but everyone wants to hang their hat on those two studies and they will reject the hundreds of other randomized controlled trials of tremendous grade A um, uh, quality. Um, they reject it based on those two studies. And of course, as you well know, the orthopedic surgeon and the, the cardiologist and the other doctors will reject it because of their confirmation bias. What confirmation bias is, it's not what we were taught or trained to do. Um, our brain says, no, we shouldn't do it because of the Finkel and Vegan study that showed that it was harmful. Well, those two studies are so flawed and, and they're really not outcome studies or randomized controlled trials. They're sure, there's just purely retrospective analysis of an insurance database showing that patients that took testosterone had a higher risk of heart attacks. But the statistical analysis that they use has been very flawed. It's been determined that those studies should be trashed, they should be withdrawn, but everyone wants to hang their hat on those two studies because they were negative. And that's our confirmation bias against the use of testosterone. And because those two studies showed that it was harmful, which every study shows that it's not, it's beneficial and protective. Because those two studies showed that, the FDA then says, we are obliged to notify doctors in the public by putting a black box warning on testosterone that's in the PDR. So the doctors will read the PDR and says, oh, it causes heart attacks and strokes. Whereas there's no good randomized control trial that supports that. And all the studies show that it does just the opposite, which is what's so challenging in prescribing testosterone. Well, right. now, really short again. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the things I say when, when I talk to a doctor and I'm trying to educate them on this subject, um, I tell them, look, I'm not a super smart guy. I'm just a pharmacist and I don't even call myself a scientist, but I do try to think rationally and doctor, if testosterone caused heart attacks, how come 19-year-old men 
who have sky high testosterone compared to a 65 year old man endogenously naturally um how come 19 year old men aren't dropping like flies from heart attacks and really they look at me with that puzzled look and it's like yeah oh you know it's like the bingo light comes on so i mean can you respond to that at all Oh, sure. So if testosterone causes heart attacks and your testes produce testosterone and it causes heart attacks, then we should chop off your testicles. We should chop off your balls to get rid of that testosterone because we don't want you to have a heart attack. Right, right. And of course, you know, That's all the studies, as you well know, the androgen deprivation therapy or uh, LHRH agonists that are given to men with prostate cancer, it wipes out testosterone, which puts them at great risk for heart attacks yep. and increased morbidity and mortality when you lose the testosterone. So sure, if you think that it does, then let's chop off your balls. Um, let's protect you against those heart attacks. And of course, in every study, when we wipe out testosterone uh, with medications for prostate cancer, um, there's a significant increase in morbidity mortality uh, from cardiovascular disease when you lose your testosterone. But more importantly, um, it's important to say all the randomized controlled trials that are outcome studies show that not only does it not cause it, but it protects against it. Here, read this. And as you know, last year, I did the webinar series on testosterone, the 100 most important papers and studies in the literature that you should know and understand on the benefits of testosterone. And of course, the reason for it was to show that it's so protective against cardiovascular disease. It is the best drug to use for cardiovascular protection. And of course, nobody knows it and understands it because of the confirmation bias. It's terrible. Now <laughs> yeah. Now we're, we're kind of focusing right now on men because that's usually what people people will relate testosterone to men. But as you know, and as I will know, and as I talk to many people about how important testosterone is for women. So will you discuss the cardiovascular, but why testosterone is, is important for women and the cardiovascular benefits for women? Will you discuss that? Really? We, we should focus on women? Really? Is that important? Really? Right, okay. right. Yeah, I know. Isn't it a shame? Um, it is. And, and as you know, the, the literature is so full of papers and studies and articles on what testosterone does for women for cardiovascular protection. Um, so let me go back. In order to answer your question, I, I have to go back. And this is going to take five minutes to yep. um set the stage for why testosterone is important for both men and women. So there are these two world expert lipidologists, uh, Dr. Dayspring and Dr. Snyderman, who frequently lecture at medical academies and they do podcasts, et cetera, with, like with Dr. Atiyah. Um, and these guys um, continually claim and purport that it is so important to measure and lower apolipoprotein B because apolipoprotein B has been shown to be the most important cardiovascular risk marker to lower and correct. It is the most predictive cardiovascular risk marker to study that will predict one's risk for getting cardiovascular disease or heart attacks. Of course, they promote the use of statins, cardiovascular drugs, um, to the common ones are Lipitor and Crestor, to lower LDL cholesterol in order to lower apolipoprotein B because apolipoprotein B is so important to lower. And it is true that it is probably the most important cardiovascular risk marker. But then they go on to say, well, um, the problem is, is that the incidence and risk for cardiovascular disease has continually increased in the last 10 years. Yeah, right. Well, if the risk of our cardiovascular disease and death and mortality is increasing and everyone is getting statins to lower their cholesterol and their ApoB, then how do you expect, how do you explain this continual increased risk for cardiovascular disease, mortality and morbidity that is not being reversed by giving people statins? Well, the simple answer is um, there's another issue. There's another problem. And lowering ApoB with a statin does not fix all of those problems. It'll fix some. And as you know, the statin studies show that there's a 2 to 3% absolute risk reduction in cardiovascular events, heart attacks. 2 to 3%. Two to absolute, 3%? absolute risk, not relative risk. Absolute risk. That's what's important. Why are we giving a drug that only works in 2 to 3% of people? And how do we know which of those two or 3% are? Well, then you have to treat the whole entire group. Well, that's great. 
but you still only have a two to three percent absolute risk reduction. Why? Because you're not lowering the APOB enough. Well, it's not lowering the APOB that's so important. It's how you lower the APOB that's important. And that's what they don't get. And that's what they're missing. So they're giving statins to lower APOB, but they're still seeing a significant increased risk for cardiovascular events and death and morbidity and mortality. <laughs> Why? Because they're missing the point. It's not lowering the APOB, which they do with a statin. It's how you lower it. Testosterone also lowers APOB, but it reduces visceral fat. Statins increase visceral fat, which actually makes the disease and the dyslipidemia worse. Yeah. So yes, there are a small amount of decrease in events, 2 to 3% absolute risk reduction. But the problem is, and as you well know, the outcome studies with testosterone show a 50 to 75% absolute risk reduction. And in one study, a 10-year study, there was 100% absolute risk reduction. Nobody in the study group that got testosterone had a heart attack over 10 years. Everyone in, you know, it was like so wow. much increase in heart attacks and death in the control group. They didn't take testosterone, but everyone ignores that because, oh, you got to lower the ApoB, but it's not working. And the reason it doesn't work is because you can't simply lower ApoB with a drug. It's how you lower it. And if you lower it with a statin, it only works in two to 3%. If you lower it with testosterone, which reduces the visceral fat in both men and women, and when you reduce the visceral fat, that's the key, then you'll see this significant absolute risk reduction when men take testosterone that you only get a 2 to 3% when they use a statin, and they just simply don't get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some ways, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, when we think about this, and I, again, I try to be a rational person, and I try to make it simple for people. And, you know, a lot of times when um, men get put on cholesterol lowering medications, they're in their early 50s, a lot of times, and, you know, for the first time in their life, their cholesterol is high. And they're, or, you know, their LDL and apolipoprotein B, possibly, if that got checked. And what I like to say is that, just like you're saying, is that testosterone helps to lower cholesterol. It helps to keep your lipids in check. So you don't lack a statin, you lack testosterone. So why aren't doctors checking testosterone on patients that, are, uh, that have high cholesterol instead of prescribing statins? Can you comment on that? If you could answer that question, you would get the Nobel Prize in medicine. <laughs> Why don't doctors do blank? Why don't doctors do this? Why don't they measure testosterone? Why don't they prescribe it? Why don't they administer it? Why don't they optimize it? Um, they're not taught or trained to. Yeah. It's a, it's a simple answer. And of course, as you know, if a doctor is not up on something, they're down on it. If they're not up on testing testosterone and they're not up on prescribing it and how to optimize it, then they're going to be down on it. And most doctors are not up on it, so they're down on it. And as a result, they fight against it because they don't do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't want to do it. And they fight and push back against it. It's a confirmation bias. They're not taught or trained, and therefore we're going to be against it. But what about all these studies to show benefit? Well, we'll ignore that. How can you ignore the science and the literature? It's in your cardiovascular studies and your literature that testosterone works so much better than a statin. And as you well know, statins reduce and suppress testosterone levels 50%. So you'll lower your, your testosterone levels 50%. You'll affect visceral fat. That's why one of the reasons statins increase visceral fat and don't work all that well. And you'll lower libido and sexual function with your statin. And, and we'll then simply give the testosterone to make up for that. They don't because they can't conceptualize it because it's not something they're taught or trained. Even this, it's in their own literature, but they ignore it. Well, and I think one of the things is, too, is it, it is, you know, you kind of said it, it, ignoring it is literally ignorance. And, um, you know, part of the issue is, too, is there's some pushback maybe from the, you know, traditional side of healthcare care um, because um, I think maybe because there's it's not become mainstream, although there's thousands and thousands of patients and doctors that, that think different. But um the reality of it is, is that when you look at the studies or just think rationally about it, it just makes complete sense. If your testosterone is optimized, when, when a man or a woman's testosterone is optimized in their 20s and 30s, they don't have heart attacks. So you got to think when we're thinking that testosterone causes heart attacks in people that are 60 or 70, when their testosterone is typically the lowest, 
um, doesn't make a lot of sense. And just because they go on testosterone, you know, association does not prove causation. So that's one of the issues I have with some of those, you know, poor studies that you referenced earlier is that, you know, just because they're on testosterone doesn't mean that it caused the problem. Here's my um, comment, too, is that we know the cardiovascular benefits of testosterone. So, you know, when a man is 50 or 60 years old and we put him on testosterone and that's the first time they've been on testosterone, the damage has been done for 20 or 30 years, correct? I mean, yep. we should have put him on testosterone earlier. Yeah, I know. Exactly. We, we got a special guest to say hi. Oh, my God. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's get my wonderful wife, Janet. Our, our, yeah, get our, back to work. Did, yeah, did you get back to work? She can't hear you. He's saying get back to work. <laughs> I wanted – Janet wanted to say hi to you, Dr. Ruzier, So, Well, hi, Janet back. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. So, yeah. Comment on on that. Um, you know, the the damage being done is is that possibly why when people go on testosterone, um, there's been an association, even though it's not causative, um, because the damage has already been done for twenty or thirty years. If they don't go on testosterone until they're sixty five or seventy, can you comment on that? Yes. Do I have a couple hours? Um, <laughs> the I know it's fascinating, and of course, you, you you said earlier it only makes rational sense looking at the studies to show that it's beneficial when you take it, and it's harm when you don't take it, and your levels are low for twenty years. Why doesn't everyone take it? It it only makes sense. It's so rational, but you don't understand. Doctors are typically not rational, and they will reject anything that. Well, if if it was so good, everyone would be doing it. Well, everyone is doing it. Right. The only people that are not doing it are stupid enough not to read their own literature and the science behind it. Those are the people that are not doing it. Did you call me stupid? Yes, I did, doctor. I did call you stupid. Here, read this. And as you all well know, here, read this stack, read this stack, read this stack, read this stack of what testosterone does. It has a positive effect on every cardiovascular marker. And it lowers visceral fat. And it lowers all the inflammatory markers that statins do not. It does everything that the statins do not. And yet everyone rejects it. Well, here, read this. No, read this, what the science and the literature says, and it's out of your own literature. What is it that you don't get about your own science and your literature? Please explain that, doctor. Here it is in your own literature. It shows that it works and it's extremely beneficial. Yes, but in the PDR, it says it's heart attacks. <laughs> That's because the FDA requires it to say that there's blood clots and heart attacks in the PDR based on two flawed studies. But those studies that are flawed have not been rejected. And you want to hang your hat on a, two flawed studies that are completely worthless and meaningless. And you reject all of these other studies in this literature that shows it's protective and beneficial. Why do you reject your own science and literature? Randomized control trials that show that it works and it's beneficial. And in the control groups that don't get it, there's increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. What is it that you don't get about that? Well, if it was so good. No, you didn't answer my question. What is it that you don't get? about your own science and literature that shows benefit to it. Well, if it was, you still don't answer my question. My question is specific. Why don't you get and understand your own literature that shows that it's beneficial? And if you don't take it, there's a significant risk of heart attack and heart disease over 20 or 30 years. What is it that you don't get about that? They don't have an answer. They can't answer it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and and it, I mean, one of the things is, is like, you know, I, one thing I love about you, Dr. Ruzier, is you're, you're just completely honest, completely black and white, um, kind of a little bit like me. Unfortunately, we don't make everybody happy because <laughs> some people, you know, because some people don't like don't like those kind of attitudes. But I'm a black and white kind of guy and you just call it out. And I really appreciate you doing that. I really, really do. It's important. It's important for our patients, because if not, we'll never move forward um, in optimizing their overall health. So thank you so much for that. Well, you're welcome. And it's unfortunate that most doctors don't understand it. And of course, you know, as you well know, if we put patients on testosterone, we have to tell them, you know, if you go and tell your doctor that you're on it and come back and say, well, my doctor says we're done. We are absolutely done. I'm not going to argue with your doctor. So if you want to tell them, fine, but we, we are going to come to an impasse with your doctor because they do not understand it. Here, read this. Read it. You understand this paper. Give it to your doctor. He threw it in the trash. Yeah, I know. That's perfect. Great. 
you know, well, and, and it, the medical literature and science in the trash because they just reject it. Why? Because they don't do it. They don't understand it. They don't know how to do it. And if a doctor's not up on it, they're down on it. And it's really a shame, Sean. That, that it is. And, you know, um, I've got a story to share about that. You know, it, it's sad that we have to hide that. Sometimes patients have to hide that from their primary care doctors or their cardiologists. Let me tell a quick story. So we work with a with a um, um, provider that was trained by you. And um, he had a brother that had a cardiovascular event in his 50s and went to a cardiologist. And, of course, they they gave him the run of the mill stuff, you know, statins and I'm sure beta blocker, aspirin, all that kind of stuff. And um, his brother's like, OK, I mean, you know, he put a stent in or whatever and he saved your life. That's great. But let's let's do some other things. So um, his brother optimized his hormones and, you know, thyroid and testosterone included. And um, later on, the, I mean, and, he, and I mean, he lost weight. He felt better. He felt better than he felt in years. Um, and he quit taking the statin and stuff. And, you know, his brother told him, he said, don't tell the, don't tell the cardiologist what you're doing. <laughs> you're right. And you have to lie to him. That's too bad. That's really too bad. But he yeah, goes no, back. It is. He it's goes back to cardio. Yeah. He goes back to cardiologist and the cardiologist says, man, I don't know what you're doing, but your numbers look incredible. You feel great. You've lost weight. Your um, lipids look great. Um, keep doing what you're doing. And he had to hide it from what he's doing, from what, from what he was doing. And the sad part is, is that the cardiologist, in my opinion, should ask, what are you doing? Because I want my other patients to do that. That's really what he should ask. Yeah. Well, they don't, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, yeah, I have hundreds of those, thousands of those same. Right. You do same uh, stories. Um, and of course they will go back to the cardiologist and tell the cardiologist, you know, yeah, I'm only taking the statin. You know, my HDL went from 30 up to 60 and it, and it did that only on the statin and the doctor. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Look at, look at how great this is. Yeah. And then on occasion, those patients will say, I'm not on the statin. I stopped taking it. <laughs> what? You're going to take it. Yeah. But when I was on the statin, my HDL was still 30 off of the statin and on the testosterone, my HDL is now 60. You saw in part three, Dr. Peng's labs, who's a cardiovascular surgeon, his HDL baseline was 32. And once he got on all of the hormones, his HDL went to 75. There's no cardiologist that can take a, an HDL of 30 and raise it to 75 nope. repeatedly on all these lab tests. There's no cardiologist that can do that. What does it do to the small LDL particle number and the LDL particle number? It bottoms it out. What's it do to ApoB? It puts it down to a level that could, there's no way can be achieved with a statin. What about and triglycerides? They reject it. They re oh, no, you shouldn't yeah. be on that. Well, look at my numbers. You don't think my numbers are good? <laughs> and, and, and we're starting to see more research on how important um, HDL triglyceride ratio is. So tell us about, we already said testosterone increases HDL, which is good for cardiovascular protection. What about triglycerides? What does testosterone do with triglycerides? It lowers it, of course. And as you well know, um, all the studies using fibrates that lower triglycerides, unfortunately, do not improve outcomes. And the reason is, is the, the fibrate, which can lower triglyceride, that's a surrogate number, um, doesn't really mean anything because all the studies show that it didn't work, which is why most cardiologists don't even use fibrates anymore. So why? Why does not, why do the fibrates not work when they lower triglycerides? because they don't lower the visceral fat. You have to lower the visceral fat. So it's not how you lower the triglycerides. Uh, excuse me, it's not lowering the triglycerides. It's how you lower it. And you right. lower it with testosterone, which reduces the visceral fat. Um, we know what that does. When you lower the visceral fat, it decreases triglycerides significantly. Um, and it protects, it reverses that dyslipidemia with high triglycerides and low HDL that most people have. And even though their LDL cholesterol is 25 and they're on a statin, the triglycerides are still high and the HDL is still low. And that's the risk factor. That's what's driving the disease process that the cardiologists completely miss because they're so focused on statin and ApoB and we don't know what to do with the triglycerides or HDL, so we'll ignore it. But wait a minute, what do you mean ignore it? The most recent literature and the lipidology literature shows the most recent study. If you don't lower the triglycerides and raise the HDL, and the ApoA, the Apo lipoprotein A, if you don't fix that, the disease will still continue to progress, which is what they completely miss. But they don't know how to fix the triglycerides HDL, so they sort of ignore it. And that's what Dayspring and Snyderman talk about. Well, yeah, there's problems. 
Um, but we don't know how to fix that because the drugs didn't work. Yeah, we know how to fix it. Look at all the studies where when you lower the triglycerides and raise the HDL with testosterone, it works. It fixes the problem. Right. But okay. since there's no drug to do that, we'll just ignore the apolipoprotein A and the HDL because we don't know how to fix it, even though it's probably the most important significant risk factor for driving cardiovascular disease, and we don't know how to fix it, so we'll ignore it. And and there we answer the question that you ask in a lot of your presentations. What if we had a drug that could? Well, it's, it's testosterone. All of I that. Mean, if we just had a drug that would do that, right? Yeah, it'd be great. It would sell like hotcakes. Right. It would be the most prescribed medicine in the whole entire world. And here's the drug. Well, you can't use that. You shouldn't use that. No, you don't want to. You know, you don't want to take testosterone. It's really, it's really sort of fascinating how beneficial it is, and we've got it, and it's rejected and ignored. Just thoroughly amazing. Yeah. So, um. Heart attacks are normally caused by a, a clot. Is that correct? Heart attacks or stroke, cardiovascular disease, normally caused by a clot, correct? Or a cardiovascular accident, normally caused by a clot, correct? Correct. The okay. event the event that we're trying to protect against is the heart attack. Okay. So but, does does test – oh, go ahead, Dr. Ruzier. But you can't have a heart attack unless you have plaque. Okay. So does testosterone cause blood clots? I talked to someone yesterday that was under the impression that testosterone caused blood clots. Can you comment on that? Sure. The reason that we say that it causes blood clots is because if you go to the PDR and you look up testosterone, it says there's an increased risk of blood clots. If you go to the American Academy of Urology Guidelines, it says in bold print, testosterone does not cause blood clots. So why did the the Urology Academy guidelines state that it does not cause blood clots, whereas other doctors think that it does. Uh, it's a very complex answer that most people wouldn't quite understand or grasp because um, it's so complex. But yes, it says it's in the PDR, but nowhere in any study, in an outcome study, does it show that it increases blood clots. But because one person reported it to the FDA that these patients that have a congenital thrombophilia, which is factor V Leiden, get blood clots when they're on testosterone, there was no control group. That paper was given and published and given to the FDA. The FDA said, well, we have to report it as, since it was reported to us that there's a risk of blood clots, we then have to state it in the PDR that there's an increased risk of blood clots. Even though the study that was reported was so flawed because it took men that normally get blood clots and put them on testosterone and they got blood clots. Well, of course, patients with factor five Leiden get blood clots. And of course, the Finkel and the vegan study showed that there was increased risk for heart attacks if they got a prescription for it. We don't know if they took it. It was just giving them a prescription that they looked in the computer database um, and they ignore all the outcome studies showing that it does not cause blood clots right. and protects against it. We are misled to believe that it causes blood clots, which it does not in any outcome study. But you have to see they sort of go around the back door. Well, this one paper got published that showed blood clots. So therefore we have to alert and notify the public that there's a blood clot. So it says it as a black box warning in the PDR because the FDA required it because somebody reported it, but it's not shown in any outcome study to cause any harm, only benefit. So back to your question um, about does it cause heart attacks? No, it does not. It protects against the plaque buildup that eventually results in the heart attack. So yes, it protects against the heart attack, the event, the blood clot, but it also protects against the plaque buildup over 20 years that eventually results in such thick plaque that it causes a heart attack. So it prevents the cause of the problem, which is plaque buildup. It also reduces plaque, which causes the event, which is the heart attack. So it protects against two types of heart disease, the blood clot, and it protects against the plaque that builds up that results eventually in cardiovascular disease and blood clots. And we completely ignore all that data and all those studies. It's thoroughly amazing. You, you push my button, Sean. <laughs> oh, hey, I know. I, it's my button too. That's why I pushed it because, you know, I, I, I fight this with doctors all day long. And, you know, I enjoy what I do and I enjoy getting educated by you so I can debate with them um, and and rationally and scientifically. And so I really appreciate you giving them the data because that's, that's uh, you know, there's not a lot of people doing that. So I really, I really appreciate all your knowledge and you sharing that. So thank you. It's difficult to tell somebody that still thinks the world is flat 
that the world is not flat, it's round. It's difficult yeah. to convince them. Right. No matter how much you try, Sean, and I know you're very good at it, and you're so very passionate about it, probably the most passionate pharmacist that I know. Um, wow. To try Thank to you. That, that means a lot. Show them that, look, you've got it wrong. You're incorrect in your thought process and your thinking. Here, read this. And that's what you should really do is, here, read these studies and these papers out of the cardiovascular literature showing the protective benefits of testosterone. Here, read this. Yeah, but it says in the PDR. It says it in the PDR because of two flawed studies and because uh, this one physician, um, Gluek, published this paper that pa patients with factor V Leiden that take testosterone get blood clots. Well, patients with factor V Leiden get blood clots all the time. Where was right. the control group that testosterone increased it? There was not a control group. <laughs> well, that's an extremely flawed, again, study, which the FDA right. says, well, it's really not good evidence of any blood clots, but because it was reported to us, we have to put it in the PDR and that's why it's in the PDR. And if it's in the PDR, then there must be, it must cause blood clots, right? No, it doesn't cause blood clots. Well, why does it say in the PDR? Because if FDA requires it, it says it because of a couple flawed studies and all of the other randomized control trials for 10 years show benefit and no blood clots or heart attacks or strokes or DVTs or PEs, but that outcome data in all these randomized control trials is ignored. Sean, you're pushing my button too early. To <laughs> I love it. I meant to. I wanted to. I love it. I, I, you know, I mean, ever since I first met you uh, ten years ago or so, I, I just love listening to you. Listen to you speak because finally, it's it felt like I found somebody that had the passion that I did and wasn't scared to share it and possibly be, you know, maybe um, shunned for it, um, but doing the right thing for for patients. So I appreciate it, Doctor Rougier. Well, well, thank you. Um, let me get back to the original uh, statement that you made way earlier in the broadcast, okay. which I've been sort of chomping at the bit to bring up and, and address. Um, in the last 30 minutes, we've talked about cardiovascular disease, ApoB, apolipoprotein A, um, reduction of visceral fat, reduction of inflammatory cytokines that drive the disease, how to raise the HDL how to fix that dyslipidemia, and that's all fine and good. And, and from a scientific standpoint, um, that's extremely important because you're on a daily basis having to interact with physicians. But what you said earlier was that there's a couple attendees, listeners, that have mentioned to you that it has completely changed their lives and changed the practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. And you also went on to say, that there's probably hundreds of thousands of patients that also go back to the physicians and say, you've changed my life. You've changed how I feel, how I function. I'm losing weight. I feel great. I got great energy. I got great sex drive performance, um, which is the icing on the cake, but they feel and function so much better. And patients come to me and go to their doctors, which is why all the doctors come back and con contact me and say, you have no idea how many doctors' lives and practices you've changed, yeah. but you also do not know and realize the hundreds of thousands of patients that you've benefited and that have a significant improved quality of life and health. You have no idea how many lives that you've changed. Well, I don't do this to, to, to accomplish that. I do it because... I'm so passionate about this is the science and the literature. Right. <laughs> what is it that we don't understand about this? But the results that we get and the patient's lives that we've changed and the doctor's practices and lives that we've changed is unsurpassed. There's no drug that does that. There's no statin that does that. There's there's no there's no cardiovascular disease patient that comes back to the doctor and say, wow, thank you, doctor. You changed my life with your statin and my blood and my beta. Right. Blood. I've never heard that. That's, <laughs> I mean, it's a great point. I've exactly. never heard somebody say that. Thank you for putting me on that statin. I feel so much better. Yeah. And no beta blocker. My God, I feel so much tremendously better. <laughs> right. All the patients come to us and say, we got to get off these medicines. We feel like crap on them. Right. We right. feel like crap. They're not doing anything. Oh, well, you got to take it. You got to hang in there. Yeah. You know, no, you don't got to hang in there. All the doctors want to take, all the patients want to go off of the drugs because they don't feel well on them and we can, they can go off of them because if they're on the hormones, they won't need the drugs because their ApoB B is so low, <laughs> so yeah. low and they feel and, tremendously better and, and, we're and just, they don't get that. 
Right. No. And we're, you know, basically on this, on this uh, podcast, we've just been focusing on the benefits of cardiovascular um, protection with testosterone, but we could do a whole nother, a whole nother podcast on, you know, the bone health, the, the, the brain health, the, you know, mood, energy, the libido, erectile dysfunction, all these things testosterone does. I'll, like I was talking about that orthopedic surgeon that I, I said, find a better drug for osteoporosis. And then I told him, I said, and the great news is, is that drug testosterone for osteoporosis just happens to have a side effect of increased libido, increased energy, increased mood, um, increased uh, um, uh, decreased decreased fat around the middle. I mean, all these good side effects of testosterone. So whereas there is no, you know, bone density medication that is uh, approved by the FDA that are going to have the results like that. I mean, they're not. They're going to have horrible side effects like broken jaws and shattered hips, things like that. Testosterone doesn't do that. I know. is 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 a shame. Well, for you know, 20 years, I tried to get the orthopedic surgeons at my hospital, hospital to prescribe testosterone. And they said they, they can't because um, if they did, then what their peers would, you know, not like them, whatever the case may be. So I couldn't get the orthopods to do it, but I talked the PAs into doing it. And, you know, then the patient's got to be discharged from the hospital and go back and see the PA and the PA then prescribes it for them. And the orthopod doesn't even know, <laughs> which is right, so very, right. so very interesting. You know, they, yeah. they put them in the hospital, they put a pin in them and they throw them in bed and then they expect them to heal and they don't. Yeah. Jump out of bed and go do physical therapy. Yeah. Right. No. It, right. Right. They don't get it. They just simply don't get it. They don't understand it. And they don't want to do it because well, what, what will my peers, what will my doctors say? What will my friends say? No, we can't do it because nobody else likes it. So therefore we can't do it. So the patient just suffers. Yes. Perfect. Right. You're such a good doctor. Right. So speaking of that, you and I had a, you and I had a great conversation last night. You shared a, um, I think it's a fairly recent story about a patient that had advanced stage four breast cancer. Is that correct? Yes. Can you, can you share that story again? Um, I, 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 our listeners and viewers need to hear this. I mean, I, I, I was just blown away. Not really that surprised because I've heard stories like this from you before and um, from other practitioners that have been trained by you. So, you know, sh- share this story. I don't really want to share the story. Um, I will. I don't want to share the story because the story is very upsetting. Yeah. And it's upsetting yeah. from the standpoint of it's just like what, what I just spoke about with testosterone is that what is it that you don't get about the science and literature? Well, you know, you know, uh, they don't get it because they're not taught and trained well where can they go to get taught and trained there is no venue except the training courses as you as you well know that you've attended so it's so very fascinating to me that we ignore all the data and the literature and the science because of our confirmation bias well if everyone if it was so good everyone would be doing it well everyone is doing it that knows the literature and the science right. so this is um one of those and i've got a hundred of these same stories that are the same except that the one that i discussed with you yesterday was one that i just saw yesterday uh and it will allude to one of the first questions um that was posted earlier um this was a lady who is uh, 62 years of age that had stage four metastatic breast cancer um and the way that she was originally diagnosed with stage four breast cancer was that she developed severe pain and weakness in her in her legs Well, of course, she went um, and had an x-ray done, and the x-ray showed multiple collapsed uh, vertebral bodies, um, secondary to a metastatic disease of some sort, which eventually was breast cancer. So she sort of had an end-stage disease. Um, There was pretty much nothing that they could do for her other than tell her that, you know, you're probably going to be dead in the next year. Um, They offered her nothing for her bones um, because her bones were so deteriorated. Um, and they pretty much didn't really offer much of anything. Um, they offered her chemotherapy, um, which um, she said, is it going to make me really, really sick? Yes, it will. But, you know, it may give you another two or three months of life. Uh, right. They offered a radiation, which she did a couple times to try to help improve her metastases to her spine. Um, and pretty much she was offered um, tamoxifen uh, or aromatase inhibitor. She tried those earlier, um, didn't do well on them. After a month of taking them, she stopped them because it made her feel so sick. Um, So anyway, um, she ended up getting referred to um, a doctor who's one of the attendees um, by a friend of the doctor. And make a long story short, um, she ended up going to the doctor and um, the 
doctor then referred her to me because he was a little bit uncomfortable with doing what I do and what I did. Um, and to make a long story short, um, after um, about 10 months of being on very high dose testosterone and very high dose progesterone, 200 QID, um, and uh, having a testosterone level um, typically around 800 to 1,000, which is the level that we shoot for for a man, mm -hmm. she had her scans redone. The only spot in her body that still lights up as a tumor is in her sternum. And all of the other metastases that lit up on scans are no longer there. Wow. All of her tumor markers that were into 500 to 1,000 are now all back below 50. And she's just ecstatic. She feels great. Um, and of course, you know, her quality of life is tremendously better as a result of it. Whereas before, you know, she was depressed and wanted to, you know, kill herself and die because of her disease and the fact that nobody wanted to give her anything or could do anything other than offer her chemo um, or the aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen. There was pretty much nothing else to do. Um, and her numbers, her tumor markers are excellent. They're back down into the normal range. Um, she went to this, her oncologist and the oncologist looked at the scans and looked at the tumor markers and said, okay, um, are you doing chemo with somebody else? No. Are you doing, you know, any medication, the tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors? No. Then why are your tumor markers back down into the normal range? And why are all the scans now normal except for the sternum? What are you doing? Um, she says, well, I'm taking high dose progesterone and testosterone. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and she got into a confrontation with him about what she was doing and she couldn't get him to grasp. Look at my scans and look at my tumor markers. What is it that you don't understand about those tests? Well, you shouldn't be. Uh, no, you didn't answer my question. She says. So anyway, she got into this big confrontation and, um, confrontation with him and decided that it was no longer in her best interest to see this oncologist. So she had to switch oncologists, take her medical records with her and go see the oncologist. But she did not tell the oncologist what she was doing. Right. Isn't and the oncologist sad? says, you know, so what, what are you doing? And she says, I can't tell you. Well, why can't you tell me? I just can't tell you. Well, why can't you tell me? I'd like to know what you're doing. You know, which, which chemotherapy drug are you taking? This resulted in such tremendous improvement. She says, I'm not taking a chemotherapy drug. Well, then what are you doing to get those results? I can't tell you. And I refuse to tell you. And I won't tell you. I just want you to follow my tumor markers. And I want you to order my scans and follow my scans. That's all I want you to do. I don't want any treatment. I just want you to do the test. That's all I want. Isn't it a shame? It is. It's a total <laughs> shame. And, and you know, that's it. The first, look the, the first results and look at those tests. And and that's really if the oncologist really cared about helping the patient with cancer, they shouldn't really care what they're doing. I mean, the patient was looking better there and the scans and all the markers of cancer were better and the patient felt better. Isn't that the goal of the oncologist or, shame, or is it not? Shame on you, Sean. Shame on you for saying that the oncologist should care. Shame on you for saying that. <laughs> right, right. So I do have a question because we did have a um, a listener or that put in a question. So what did you know about the patient's, um, was it progesterone uh, receptor positive? Was it estradiol receptor positive? Do you know those, those um, questions on that particular patient? Yes, I do. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, and I hate to say this, um, the oncologists are not hormone doctors. No. So um, the most common patient has an estrogen positive tumor and a progesterone positive tumor. Um, some of them have Herceptin positive, some, some do not. For estrogen positive tumors, um, giving them estrogen or estradiol will stimulate that receptor. Um, and of course, that's why most patients that have cancer get aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen to block that estrogen receptor because estrogen can stimulate that receptor. The opposite is, of, is true of the progesterone receptor. If you have a progesterone positive receptor, that's good. If you have an estrogen receptor, that's actually good for the outcome, but you don't want to take estrogen because it'll stimulate that receptor. But a positive receptor for progesterone stimulates the tumor to become apoptotic. So stimulating the progesterone receptor causes the cell to go into an apoptotic phase. Stimulating the estradiol receptor with estradiol causes the tumor to grow. 
So probably should not take estradiol. The doctors will be absolutely against that unless you read Arvind Blooming's book, Estrogen Matters, where he says, yes, but all the outcome studies when they gave estrogen to women with breast cancer decreased the risk of recurrence and made them live longer. But we, that's a whole other story. Right. But I mean, I just, I, can I comment on that really quick? Sure. I mean, if you think about it and, I, you know, I'm just a pharmacist, but, um, you know, when I remember learning about cell division and, you know, when cell is in a, in a differentiation stage, that is when it is at most risk for cancer. And if estradiol helps cells proliferate to the final form of a correct cell, whether it be breast, whether it be a breast tissue or whether it be um, uterine tissue. So if it helps it differentiate into that final good form of a cell, then estradiol would actually make sense that estradiol would actually help breast cancer. Well, it, it does, but that's difficult to explain because yes. we all know that the oncologist will say, no, you have to block the estrogen positive receptor because the study showed when you block it, it will decrease recurrence. But giving them estradiol or estrogen also decreases recurrence. And as you know, that study published in the in JAMA two years ago, the only drug in the world that has been shown to be successful in reducing breast cancer mortality is, it's not an AI, it's not tamoxifen, it is estrogen. Well, wait a minute, but they got a positive estrogen receptor. How can you give somebody estrogen if they got a receptor? That's why you can't give estrogen to a woman with estrogen positive breast tumors because the oncologist will say no and they will have a fit. But then the patients will come to us and say, yeah, but what about Blooming's book? What about all these 60 studies to show that in women that had breast cancer that took estrogen, in every single study, there's a reduction in the risk. Well, you have to understand what goes on inside the cell, which is beyond the scope of this talk. It's the insulin and glucose inside the cell that's driving the disease and increasing the aromatase enzyme that increases the cellular estradiol inside the cell. Well, yes, and if you block that, it will re reduce it. But you also don't understand with the estradiol, it will reduce the estradiol, excuse me, reduce the insulin and glucose inside the cell that's driving the disease. And that's what people don't grasp and understand and the oncologist will not. But you have to look at outcome studies where there's a benefit in taking estrogen in outcome studies. Yeah, there's 60 studies to show in women with estrogen positive tumors, there was benefit in outcomes. And it was the only drug that reduced mortality long term. The AIs do not, the tumors come back. Tamoxifen, the tumors come back. With estradiol or premarin, the tumors can come back, but at a much lesser rate than with tamoxifen or with an AI, which is why the study proved long term, it's the estrogen that reduces breast cancer mortality. And there's no other drug that does that. So that's the estrogen side of it, but don't give estrogen to a woman with breast cancer because the oncologist will have a fit. But so, read Blooming's book, Estrogen Matters, and you'll understand why estrogen works in women that have breast cancer. But to answer the question of progesterone, yes, progesterone is extremely important. Tilly's studies last year published in um, Lancet Oncology showed and proved that progesterone in very high dose is very apoptotic to breast cancer cells and should be used. But most doctors think progesterone receptor. No, you can't give progesterone because progesterone is medroxy progesterone acetate. That makes the tumors worse. So no hormones. And we'll ignore all of Tilly's and all those studies because they just don't know it or understand it. For our listeners and viewers, um, Dr. Rousier, that don't know what apoptotic means, will you explain what apoptotic means? Apoptotic means it kills the cancer cell. Boom. So stimulating the androgen receptor with testosterone kills the cancer cell. It's apoptotic to the cancer cell. Stimulating the progesterone receptor with progesterone is apoptotic to the cancer cell, which kills the cancer cells, which is why progesterone is so important in breast cancer patients. And that's why testosterone is so important in breast cancer patients. But testosterone can convert into and raise estradiol. And so the oncologist will say, no, no testosterone, no. But what about all these outcome studies to show benefit? Well, we'll ignore those studies because you can't take it because it causes conversion into estradiol. But stimulating the androgen receptor overcomes that. And in every outcome study, that's why we use it, because we see a decrease in tumor markers and a decrease in the tumors. But they'll ignore that because they're not taught or trained because they're not hormone doctors. They're cancer doctors that administer chemotherapy. They're not hormone doctors that understand right. the hormone literature. So, no, you can't give hormones to a patient with breast cancer. <laughs> okay. Unless Thank it's you for, fewer years. 
<laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. I, I, I love your honesty there. And I, I love it when I'm at a live conference with you and you you explain all the science and, and all the data behind it. And then you say, nope, you can't do it. And why not? Because the oncologist says you can't. So anyway, I appreciate that, Dr. Ruge. We the oncologist another- has a higher place in heaven than you do. So exactly. therefore, the oncologist will overrule you all the time. Exactly. So we do. It is. Yeah, we do have another question. Uh, Steph, will you want to stream that other question on melatonin? So does melatonin, taking melatonin regularly, decrease endogenous production of melatonin? So does it um, decrease your natural production after you've taken it? No. Um, all the other hormones have this negative feedback inhibition loop, testosterone, thyroid, um, cortisone, cortisol, um, synthetic birth control pills will suppress FSH and LH. So there is a negative feedback effect to almost all of the hormones. Um, is there a negative feedback effect with melatonin? Yes, when you take it, but the reason you take it is because your levels are not high enough anyway to do any good. But if you stop it the next day, and you can do this with measuring melatonin levels, when you stop it, your melatonin is back to the same production that it was um, the next day, even though you took melatonin the day before. So if there's a negative feedback inhibition, it is very short. It's not prolonged like it is with thyroid and testosterone and other hormones. So taking it does not suppress it to the point where it's detrimental because if you take it, it'll work for a day or two when you take it. And as soon as you stop it, then you don't sleep well because your level is back down to what it was before. And that's why you're taking it is because your level or your sensitivity to the receptor site is not what it used to be, which is why melatonin works. But no, essentially, there's no negative feedback inhibition effect that is prolonged. And I think that is probably the question. Yeah, it sure is. So, uh, Dr. Ruzier, we are going to wrap up this podcast. We would love to have you on our show again because uh, you are an incredible wealth of knowledge. And our goal at Health Solutions is to educate and empower people to take care of their own health. And hormones are a big part of that. So, you know, we believe in lifestyle medicine with exercise and diet and sleep um, are important also, but, um, you know, hormones are a piece of that puzzle. So um, as we wrap up the show, I just got to ask you a question. Um, I think it became rather obvious and we've even talked about this, but I just want you to talk a little bit more about it. Um, What is your passion? Oh, I I think... I think that's, um, well, obviously teaching is my passion, right. but, I, but I think what you're saying is outside of medicine and outside of teaching, what is my passion? Um, well, one of my passions is um, racing, car racing. Um, I, I build Porsche motors. I, my wife and I both race and I'm the mechanic and the engine builder. Um, aside from that, um, my passion is the, the outdoors skiing. Um, and of course, um, one of my passions is to try to outfish my wife, who's a superb fly fisherman. <laughs> so we missed out on going fly fishing with you this uh, summer. We have to do that. We have to meet up in Montana, which is the Mecca in the Missoula area of fly fishing. And I'm pretty good. So I'm hoping I can outfish your wife. Yeah. Well, um, I hope you can too, because uh, she's, she's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She'll, she'll put that fly right underneath that branch, right where that trout yep. is. Right where you know the trout's going to hit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, she's, so, she's very good at doing that. So if somebody has any questions, uh, Neil, we're going to stream your website here. But if somebody has any questions, what's uh, the best way to get a hold of you? Um, probably the, the, the best way is um, through WorldLink Medical. Okay. Um, it's worldlinkmedical.com. And um, if you want to ask questions or post questions, then uh, we'll post it to that website. And then Dana can... Uh, put it up and other people can answer it too, which is why we like the form for WorldLink. Um, the form is, uh, consists of, you know, multiple doctors um, and pharmacists that have been trained over the years that are now, quote, experts and understand the medical literature and science. Um, and as a result, we have this big form where people will post questions, problems, situations, circumstances, um, uh, patients um, that have complex uh, problems or circumstances or situations that we discuss and, and review. So that's the best way to do that. Awesome. Awesome. We will uh, put that in our edited show notes so people can um, um, 
check it out. So, Dr. Ruzier, um, I appreciate you being on. I know you're a busy guy. You got in late last night because of some flight delays, and you were still gracious enough to call me so to to make sure that our podcast went smooth today, and I, and I think it did. So I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being on and achieving our goal of educating and empowering patients to take charge of their own health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean, and thank you so much for being that pharmacist that's, that's out there trying to improve the quality of life for doctors as well as patients also. You're welcome. I actually love what I do. I really, really do love what I do. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching and listening. Um, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Christmas will be in a couple days, and I think Jen and I will probably do some kind of little surprise video on Christmas. So stay tuned um, so we can wish everybody a Merry Christmas. If you don't see us, Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Happy New Year for everyone. Tune in Monday to our podcast. As always, it'll be 1230 to 130. And honestly, I don't know who our guest is. If I, I can't think of it right now. So uh, we will let you know. Check out our uh, my Facebook, my personal Facebook, the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Facebook and YouTube site for updates on who the upcoming guests are. And stay tuned because I am going to invite Dr. Ruzier on again for another topic. So if you want to, him to talk something, talk about something specific about hormones, please let us know in the comments and we will um, um, invite him on to talk about that subject. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you.